Let us then return to Acts chapter 11. And I really want to look at the verses that we have here from verse 1 to verse 18, where basically we have uh, the Apostle Peter giving account of what we looked at last Lord's Day evening. The title I want to give to uh, the meditation this evening is Good News Travels Fast. Good News Travels Fast. This truly was a pivotal event in the life of the church. It happened about 10 years after Pentecost. We know that uh, Scripture is very economical with words. It's not verbose. It does not give us great deal of details about things without a reason. And the very fact that this, what we find in chapter 11 verses 1 to 18, was broadly covered in the previous chapter would indicate that this is something important. It certainly was important for the early church, for the mother church in Jerusalem. And uh, as we will go through the book of Acts, we will see that it is mentioned briefly in chapter 15 also, just one or two verses, but nevertheless, it is still mentioned there in chapter 15. And the subject matter that is really brought before us here doesn't seem to go away. It is, or it has been dealt with here, as we shall see, but it does resurface. And it resurfaces primarily in the ministry of Saul, who was to become the Apostle Paul. So we are looking here at a very important time in the Christian church because this occasion here is when the gospel was finally brought to the Gentiles and what Cornelius and his family and friends experienced was very similar to what the apostles and the disciples experienced at Pentecost. And that had to be so, because the Gentiles were to realize that there was only one church, and so indeed were the Jews. They were to realize that there was only one church, and the distinction between Jew and Gentile had firmly been erased. The wall had been broken down, under the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we are looking at a notable event of historical proportion in the life of the Christian church. We want to draw one or two lessons. I trust they are fresh lessons from this portion of Scripture that we're concentrating upon, verses 1 to 18 of Uh, Acts chapter 11. What's the first lesson we can draw for our edification tonight then? Well, surely the first lesson is opposition to the work of God can come from inside the church at times. Opposition to the work of God Opposition to the work of the Holy Spirit can come from inside the church at times. Surely this is what is at least drawn out for us here for our edification. If we remember Stephen's defense, did he not say something like, Ye have always resisted the Holy Spirit? And in some sense, this is what was happening here. Not exactly the same, we acknowledge, because we're told here in verse 2, 
And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. Now, who were they of the circumcision? Well, they were primarily Jews who had received Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, there's no evidence that they were false brethren. The likelihood was that they really had a serious issue that they wanted to hear and to, to be dealt with. Because we're told, Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with them, because they had heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Now, for Jew and Gentile to sit down and to have fellowship one with another, to eat and to drink was an anathema to the Jews. And this is what they draw their attention to when they begin to question Peter. Look at verse 3. Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and did eat with them. This is the charge. You went, you were in some, a Gentile's house, you sat down, you had some food with them, you had some fellowship with them, you did eat with them. This is contrary to what the Jews were taught. I don't believe we find this in the Word of God at all. Certainly the dietary laws would forbid Jews to eat certain things, things that were unclean. But there's no question that they could have t times of fellowship with Gentiles. Doesn't mean to say they had to eat with them. This would seem to be something that was added on. And therefore, they begin to ask Peter to defend himself, and they are somewhat in opposition to what he did. And there's no mention, for instance, that, that they should be rejoicing that the Gentiles had received the gospel. What did they contend Peter concerning? That he went in and did eat with them, those who were uncircumcised. You would have thought, friends, that ones who had forgiveness of sins themselves, ones who had been reconciled to God through the finished work of the Lord Jesus, in other words, ones who had tasted that the Lord was good, would be delighted if other people came to that same knowledge and same experience. But no. We have been looking through the book of Acts, and we have found that when the gospel is proclaimed that Satan will send persecution, or he will send uh, trouble in the church, as we found in Ananias and Sapphira. Or he might, on other occasions, seek to detract the apostles from the great task that was before them. That instead of preaching the gospel, they were to wait on tables. But here we find within the church, as far as we can ascertain, genuine Christians beginning to contend with Peter that he simply had some fellowship with Gentiles, something that was totally contrary to the way and the practice that the Jews were brought up. But there's no mention, no mention whatsoever that the gospel has been proclaimed. Well, friends, this is something we have to bear in mind, and this is something that we must be careful about ourselves. Friends, we must rejoice if the gospel is freely and fully proclaimed. This is what we're all about. This is the great commission that the Lord Jesus Christ has given to his church. Yes, we want the gospel to be preached with all its purity. And yes, we long for the Lord to send power upon the preaching of the gospel. But we must not find fault unnecessarily. This is what happened here when Peter was asked to give account. We should rejoice if people are being saved. We should be rejoiced if people are being diverted from the broad road that leads to destruction and instead are taking up the cross and they're being found on the narrow road that leads unto life. Surely this should 
warm our hearts when we see that God is moving and working in our day and generation. Let us therefore not be ones who put uh, opposition before these things or find fault. Let us rejoice. And if God is pleased to bless a minister who preaches the gospel and he may be in somewhat different from us, well, we should rejoice. If God is pleased to bring people into the kingdom of God by other means, then we must rejoice. It's a wonderful thing, is it not, to be saved? Is it not a wonderful thing for others to come into the kingdom? As we find here, the door was open to the Gentiles. What were the Jews in comparison to the Gentiles? Is it not glorious that the gospel has indeed gone forth? Well, secondly, surely there's another lesson here that we can derive from it. What is that other lesson? Well, it was Peter that was taken to account. He was called upon to give an account by the church. Here we have the, the mother church, the head church, and they heard about the good news and they wanted to ask what is arguably regarded as the chief of the apostles. We don't for one moment say that he was the pope, nothing like that, but he certainly was the, the spokesman for the apostles in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to him was given the keys of the kingdom. He was the one who proclaimed the gospel to the Jews first and foremost at Pentecost. And he was the one who was going to be given the honor and the privilege of opening the doors of the gospel to the Gentiles. Yet we find that he's answerable to the church. He's answerable. Although he is regarded as the principal apostle. There's a lesson, surely. There's a lesson for all of us. Here Peter was prepared to defend himself. And indeed he, in his, what we find in this narrative here, there was four things that, that God did to convince him that what he was about to undertake was truly of God. You know, Peter was a thoughtful Jew, and uh, he didn't do what he did without giving it some due thought and care and attention. But also there were four really mighty acts of God that really worked upon Peter that he would begin to do what the Lord would have him do to open the gospel to the Gentiles. Now you may well ask, what are these four things that convinced Peter that truly this was a work of God, that the, the division between the Jew and Gentile was all over now? That's, that was the meaning of that, that sheet coming down with various things on it. Peter was being told there that the Gentiles are no longer to be regarded as unclean. Well, the four things that God used to open Peter's mind and to make him obedient to the vision was, first of all, he had a vision. Peter had this vision. He, we know that he was in a trance. He was waiting for food to be prepared for him. And then suddenly he had this vision without warning. And here God was beginning to speak to Peter. Peter had to turn his back upon all his background and all his baggage that he had carried forward from his Judaism days as he was now the apostle to the, who was going to preach the, the gospel to the Gentiles. And God used a vision for him. But God also gave him a command. He had this vision, and what happens then? As he's having this vision, what do we find in the narrative? Three people had come from Cornelius. Three people had come and found out where Peter was staying. And God gave the command, you are to go with these men. I have sent them. Something that Peter wouldn't ordinarily do. But God had commanded him. And therefore, he was going to be obedient to the living God. Something else. There was this 
preparation. We've already looked at the, at the vision that Peter received, but God was working at both ends. He was working with Peter, and he was also working with Cornelius. And we know that Cornelius had a vision. And therefore, God was preparing both of these individuals that ultimately they would meet, and Peter would preach to them with the wonderful result that followed. And this was God working in the hearts and in the lives of Peter in all his circumstances, and also in the circumstances and in the life of Cornelius. And of course, then God verified everything by his wonderful action. Peter there preaching in the middle of his discourse, in the middle of the time when he's beginning to press upon them the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he's beginning to teach and to preach about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus, what happens? God sends the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles. They're heeding these wonderful things. And what happens? Their hearts are opened and they believe the gospel. And more than that, they experience the extraordinary outpouring of the Spirit, whereby they're enabled to speak in tongues, in languages that they did not know before. And this was God again confirming that what was happening was actually the hand of God. And as one commentator said, when the people here that we're looking at in chapter 11, when they heard Peter's explanation, what happened? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God. And one commentator said, their criticism ceased, their worship began. Peter was able to give a reason for the hope that was in him. In other words, Peter was able to give reasons for the actions that he had carried out. He didn't do it of his own back. He had these reasons. He was able to recall the vision. He was able to tell them about the great command that God had given to him. He was able to tell about the preparation that not only had God performed on him, but on Cornelius. And he was also able to tell about the action, about the result, that as a result of preaching the gospel, the Holy Spirit came. And who then could stop? These people had to be baptized. God had brought them into the Christian church, and if Peter did not baptize them and recognize them as true-hearted, genuine Christians, he himself would be opposing God. What is the lesson? Well, there's a couple of lessons we can learn from this, friends. Peter had to give an account. He had to be able to state why he did what he did. It's true for every Christian. We are to be able to give a reason for the hope that is in us. Are we Christians? We might not be theologians. We might not be biblical scholars. Our knowledge of the Bible may well be scant. And whose knowledge is perfect? None. And who cannot learn more? All of us can. But friends, we should be able to give a reason for the hope that is in us. We should be able to tell people that when time and opportunity come our way, we should be able to tell them why we come to the house of God, why we believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, why we look upon the Bible as the Word of God, why we believe in heaven and hell, why we believe in repentance and saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be able to articulate these things. We should not be ones who have our mouths shut and we're not able to give a reason for these glorious things. Friends, if we're Christians, we should be able in some sense to defend ourselves. This is what happened here. Peter certainly went against the grain as far as Judaism at that time was concerned, but he was able to defend his actions. And likewise, friends, it's incumbent upon us, because there will be times 
when people will wonder, why are you different? Why is it you go to the house of God on a Sabbath day or a Lord's day or the first day of the week? Why is it you're not in your garden? Why is it you're not in a restaurant? Why is it you're not on the football terraces? Why is it? Because we believe in Jesus. Why do you believe in Jesus? What's the point in believing in Jesus? What good is Jesus to you? I'm a sinner. What does that mean? None of us are perfect. Oh, but the Bible says we're all sinners. And although sin might be a light matter to many people, even to people within the church, sin is no light matter. Sin is offensive to God. And God is an infinite person. And we could use maybe language like this. Even the slightest sin, as we might judge it, even the slightest sin against an infinite person is a terrible crime. And that's why we need the Savior. And can we not articulate things like this to people who will ask us? Because we will get opportunities. That's what Peter's talking about later on in 1 Peter chapter 3. When people ask, you are to give a reason. Here's what happened to Peter. The, the people of the circumcision, the Jews, contended with them. And Peter was able to give a reason for all that he undertook. But surely, when we would consider Peter giving account, surely it reminds us, friends, that one day we'll all give an account. It may well be that we might not be able to articulate why we are Christians. It may well be that we fail and stumble. That may well happen. It's not the most easiest of things for some people to articulate and to save the reason for the hope that is in them. But one day we'll all stand before God. Peter, arguably the leader of the church, he had to give an account to the church. All of us will stand before God. What are we talking about? We're talking about that awesome day, that day of judgment. That day when God who knows all things will ask us to give an account. The Bible talks about books being opened. I don't think we're meant to believe in physical books. I just believe that simply that God is going to reveal our lives to us. Maybe he will enlighten our minds and our memories will be razor sharp on that day so that we can even remember our thoughts because we will give account for our thoughts and our words. That's what Jesus says, every idle word and our actions, everything. What a day that will be. The Bible talks about this day. In fact, the Bible would even tell us, if you look at Romans chapter 1, uh, that the worldly and the unbelieving, they know about this day. Knowing the judgment of God, it says in Romans chapter 1, and that's referring to unbelievers, they know this day of judgment's coming. Like they know, in some sense, the God of the Bible. They're not ignorant of that. Oh, they want to be ignorant, and the truth that they do know and possess, they try to suppress, and they don't live up to that knowledge. But nevertheless, they have it. And part of the knowledge of God is they know there's going to be a day of judgment. And the Bible tells us 
We can go to the Old Testament. We can go to the New Testament. The same truth is told. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23. Here the Lord is speaking. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. What's he talking about? He's talking about that day that's nearer now than it ever has been. And just before that verse, what does he say? We've quoted Isaiah 45, verse 23. Well, Isaiah 45, verse 22, what does it say? Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. And he's saying that, friends, in the light of the fact that the all of the earth, every one that's ever lived, will stand before him. Paul again, in Romans chapter 14, verses 10 and following, what does he say? What does he say about this day? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Peter had to give an account. He wasn't above the church. He had to give an account. You'll have to give an account. The minister will have to give an account. And if a minister doesn't warn, he will be taken to task for that. What did John the Baptist say to the, the scribes and the Pharisees who came? Who hath warned thee from the wrath to come? Who hath warned thee? And what does Paul say? Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. This is one of the roles of a, a gospel minister. He is to proclaim that this day is coming. And he has to warn people to flee from the wrath to come. How can you possibly flee? What can you do? The day is coming. You can't flee from the day. It's going to come whether you like it or not. You may well be dead and smoldering in your grave, but one day you'll hear the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll come out. And you'll come out and stand before him and you'll give an account. You cannot avoid the day. But friends, you can be prepared for that day. And today is the day to prepare. Good news travels fast. The Gentiles, Cornelius, his family and friends... In a very real manner, they were prepared for that day. Why were they prepared for that day? They were prepared for that day because they heard the gospel and they believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You know they had heard about the gospel before, or I should more accurately say, they had heard about Jesus Christ before. They had heard about what he had done. But when Peter brought them up to date, and revealed the full life and purpose and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he told them about his person and his work, about his life, about his death, about his resurrection, about his, his exaltation, about his intercession, and about his coming again at the end of the world, then they believed upon him and they received him as Lord and Savior. And what happened? Their sins were forgiven, and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit to affirm that truly a great work of grace had begun in them, and that their sins had been washed away. And they were, in some sense, ready for that day, because there is, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. What a blessing. 
What a blessing is yours tonight, Christian. No condemnation. Yes, you'll stand before Christ. And maybe your works will be burnt up. Paul speaks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I do believe. And many people who have been working for the Lord as Christians, they'll find that their works were not acceptable and they shall be burnt up, but they themselves shall be saved. Because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we are to build upon the foundation of Christ. And our work is to be in accordance with his will. That is to build with gold and silver and stone, not with hay and stubble. But regardless, we'll all stand before King Jesus. As indeed Peter did here, to give an account. Well, maybe the last thing we want to notice here is <clears throat> the importance and the necessity of repentance. We have here in verse 18, part of which we have already quoted, when they heard these things, that is the circumcision, they held their peace and glorified God, saying something wonderful. Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. The Jews had received it, those of the circumcision. They had received this wonderful gift, this gift that Jesus Christ has purchased for his people by all that he undertook when he came down to this world. Part of his reward was that he purchased gifts, and one of that gifts is repentance, and that's what he gives to his people. You know, friends, what does the gospel tell us? The gospel tells us that we are to repent and believe the gospel. God commands all men everywhere to repent. That's what Paul said to the Athenians as he was proclaiming the gospel to them. Gentiles, all men, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Now, we cannot do this. No man can do it. Yet every man is required to do it. We have a problem then. There's something overwhelming here. God commands that we repent, but we cannot repent. We don't have the desire. We don't have the inclination. We don't have the power. We don't have the will. What a problem we've got. And many people face this confrontation. And what do they do? They say to themselves, well, if I have to repent, but I cannot do it, then I wash my hands off it. That's what they say. And they'll say, if it'll happen, it will happen. And that's it. Friends, God commands all men everywhere to repent. We can't do it left to ourselves. What do we do? We cry out to God that he might give us this gift. It's a gift. It's a saving grace. Is that not what our catechism will tell us? Repentance unto life is a saving grace. It's something that God gives. It's like saving faith. It's a grace. That's what God gives. Whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, doth with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. There we have a very precise definition of repentance unto life, a gift. And the sinner who recognizes a true sense of his sin and of the mercy of God, that's the gift that was given to Cornelius. Cornelius, who was a, a God-feeder. Cornelius, who was a, a righteous man in some sense. To Cornelius, who was a devout individual. To Cornelius, who was a prayingful man and a man who gave charity gifts to people. 
a man whom the world would say was righteous, yet he had to know repentance unto life. He had to turn from his old life, and he had to rely upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. It's the same for all of us, friends. And this is the good news that traveled fast, and this news came back to the church. The church heard. Why? God has given repentance unto life to the Gentiles. Oh, let us open our voices. Let us proclaim this. Let us tell all. God has given this gift. How can I get it? You must believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You must call upon him. He's the one who gives the gifts. He has purchased the gifts. He has earned them. And he has poured them out upon his people. Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Friends, do we know this tonight? Do we know it? Are we like Cornelius? Devout? Godly? God-fearing? Prayerful? Charitable? Amiable? Morally upright? Helping the Jewish cause? Us maybe helping the Christian cause? But do we know repentance unto life? He had to know it. His family had to know it. His friends had to know it. We must know it. Good news travels fast. Amen. May the Lord be pleased to bless his word to us.